Good morning and welcome to Sunday School from the First United Methodist Church in Brookhaven, Mississippi. I'm Paul Bam and I teach the Lost and Found Sunday School class. Thank you for tuning in and joining us today. I encourage you to uh, get you a cup of coffee, get comfortable, and find some way to center yourself on the lesson of today. As we get started, we're we realize that we're almost to the end of March and Easter rapidly approaches. I thank you for wanting to learn more about what we're studying here in Mark. And let's turn now to the Lord in prayer. Father God, how great you are, how magnificent is your word. We thank you, Father, for the lessons we find in Mark. Thank you, Father, for helping us to understand the path that Jesus took and the opportunities he had to teach us along the way. Open the eyes of our hearts, Lord, and let us see those lessons clearly today. Father, in a, war, in a world torn apart by war and poverty, we pray for those who are oppressed today. We thank you, God, for the opportunities that you give us to, to help and help us to do our part to further your kingdom today and every day. And we pray for those who are being persecuted because of you today. In Christ's name, we ask these things. Amen. At the conclusion of our lesson last week, we found, <clears throat> we found Jesus and the twelve walking. And they left. At the end of the chapter, they moved on toward Jericho. And leaving Jericho, they <clears throat> Jesus healed a blind man. He then goes to Jerusalem and has a triumphant entry into the holy city. What was happening was the 12 still didn't understand. The crowds were sure that it was a king coming, a warrior king who was gonna free them from the oppression of the Romans and restore them to the place of great prominence that they had while King David was king. But that's not the king that came, is it? So, <clears throat> Jesus enters Jerusalem, goes on to visit the temple, and then leaves and comes home. Not home, but to Bethany, where he will spend the, the next week. Early the next morning, we pick our scripture up. And so we'll start there in Mark 11. I hope you take the chance to read the entire chapter of Mark 11. And as a matter of fact, that 12 before next week's lesson, so that we can have some continuity in the events of Holy Week. So today we find ourselves leaving from Bethany and we find ourselves in Mark 11, 12 through 14, and then 20 through 25. The next day after leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. From far away, he noticed a fig tree in leaf. So he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing except leaves, since it wasn't the season for figs. So he said to it, no one will ever eat your fruit again. His disciples heard this. I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna stop at uh, verse 14 and tell you what happened between 14 and 20, where we will pick up our scripture again. Jesus went into the temple and he found the money changers 
and he had infuriated him. And what did he do? He turned the temple off. He talked very poorly of the people inside the temple gates. And then he, then he left and went back to Bethany. And so now we pick up our scripture on, in verse 20 on the next day. Early in the morning, as Jesus and his disciples were walking along, they saw the fig tree withered from the root up. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look how the fig tree is cur you cursed has dried up. Jesus said to them, have faith in God. I assure you that whoever says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea and doesn't waver but believes that what is said will really happen, it will happen. Therefore, I say to you, Whatever you pray and ask for, believe that you will receive it, and it will be so for you. And whatever you stand and whenever you stand up to pray, if you have something against anyone, forgive so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your wrongdoings. That's the word of God for us, the people of God, and thank be to God. Uh oh. That's pretty familiar, isn't it? I know that's at least the second time that Jesus has directly told us that for our sins to be forgiven, we must forgive others. It's not an option. Oh, that we could have learned that lesson early in our spiritual path. <clears throat> Let's go back now and, and revisit and see what we can learn from the scripture. So Jesus entered into Jerusalem and <clears throat> was praised and offered the kingdom. But the next day he was hungry and he noticed a fig tree. Now, he knew it wasn't fig season. Uh, some of you might have been, had the benefit of my fig tree. I have a large fig tree at my home, and I love to share the figs from it. It produces figs, and when it's loaded with figs, you know it. And when... <clears throat> so, you know the season of the figs. Right now, that fig tree is beginning to sprout. In a month, it'll be full in leaves, but there won't be any figs. And then, later on in the summer, there will be figs. So, Jesus knew this. He knew what season of the year it was. Why did he say to the fig tree, no one will ever eat your fruit again? That's a pretty tough question to answer if you look at this. But remember that Mark talked to us in stories and gave us examples and that the fig tree represented something else. Now, what? Well, the scholars might say it represented Israel and that Israel was no longer bearing fruit. Or it might say that it represented the temple and that through the temple, the temple was no longer needed because you could go directly to God. Which brings us to Martin Luther posting his, his letter on the door of the Roman Catholic Church in Germany uh, when he was convinced that you didn't have to go through the Catholic Church to talk to God and to be to be forgiven by God. So I don't know whether that's a close allegory or not, but let's think about the temple. So 
Jesus cursed the temple? Well, maybe he said it was no longer needed, that what it represented. And we know that at the end of the week, what happened in the temple? What happened in the temple? The curtain was, was torn apart. <clears throat> so we see then that Jesus is trying to get his disciples to understand. But again, they 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 still don't have don't have it figured out. So the next day, they start back to Jerusalem. And you wonder if uh, Jesus is just having a bad couple of days because he cursed the fig tree, he goes to the temple, he sees it. The next day, the fig tree is weathered up and he goes to the temple and what does he do in the temple? Well, he, he turns over the tables and takes a whip to the money changers. That all would have occurred in the woman's court. That's where the money changers were set up. So how do, do, how do we understand that? So Peter says to him, Rabbi, the fig tree is withered from the root up. It's never going to bear fruit again. And Jesus gives us our first lesson for today. Have faith in God. <clears throat> then he says, I assure you that whoever says to the mountain, move, it will move. And uh, if they believe, I say to you, pray and ask for believe that you will receive it. But now, folks, we got to be careful about what we pray for. And we've got to pray with the right attitude. There's a story in the um, teacher's guide about an event that happened years ago. And a 40-year-old father stormed into St. Jude's Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee, a place we are all pretty familiar with and took four hostages, a psychological examiner, a pediatrician, a nurse, and a psychiatrist. He released one of them <clears throat> sadly 24 hours later as they stormed the hospital room to rescue the hostages. A Memphis SWAT team shot the man to death. A year earlier, his six-year-old son had died in the hospital. He just could not get past what had happened. Perhaps if he had received some mental illness help, he could have. Or perhaps if he could have found some forgiveness in his life. The, the hostage taking was an act of desperation. Forgiveness for an offense of that magnitude, whether real or imagined. He imagined that the St. Jude's Hospital had not done what they could, should have done or could possibly have done to save his son. The hospital was somehow responsible for his son's death. He could not forgive them. Have you ever been around people who just could not let it go? Whatever it was. Is the father in the hospital story could have forgiven the situation? How might this story have turned out differently? How could have this man's family or friends affected this situation or nurtured prayer life have been redemptive and helpful? Many of you know that in a prior life, I dealt with some situations as an insurance claims manager that were often difficult. I often recall a particular instance 
three young men in school celebrating the end of the school year were killed in a tragic, tragic automobile accident. All three were thrown from the vehicle. The vehicle was literally had the roof torn off of it. It was a terrible, terrible situation. My responsibility was to resolve this situation. <clears throat> the first time I met with the owner of the vehicle, he immediately said, I demand that you determine that my son was driving. Therefore, the other two people in the car could receive the liability benefits of his insurance policy. If his son had not been driving, his son could have received part of the benefits. Wow. One man could not believe that that was all the insurance there was. Surely there had to be more. That family could not be satisfied in any, any way. They could not let go. The third family member, <clears throat> third family, took the benefits of the liability insurance policy and started a charitable fund with it to assist others. <clears throat> That's so often what we see. One family couldn't let go. Another family took it and used it for something good, turned it into something good. This is how God wants us to be. He wants us to be able to forgive. And so we come to this uh, we come to these questions, but we also must relate them to what we are reading here. And so the first thing that we notice is that he says that we must forgive others if we're to receive forgiveness. And that sends us directly back to the Lord's Prayer. It's something that the writer of the lesson brought out that I had never really thought about before. It's us and we and not you and I. Had you ever thought about that before? Forgive us. Lead us not into temptation. Help us to forgive our debtors as we forgive those who have wronged us. Wow. That makes it a corporate prayer, doesn't it? And that's why a lot of times we say it in church, corporately. It's because. But then when we pray that, do our actions back up our words? Hmm. That causes some personal reflection, doesn't it? Do we not only pray for justice, but do we work for justice? So the whole part of the concept of this lesson is, is to help us grow our prayer life. In what ways do you perceive your prayer life to be barren? How much time do you spend listening in prayer? Oh, not uttering a word. Just stay in there. How can we grow our faith if we are not growing our prayer life? I think the two go hand in hand. What mountains stand in your way of your prayer life? Are there things that you're praying for that you should not ought to be praying for? Hmm. I can't answer those questions for you. All I can do is encourage you to reflect inwardly. So we come to the, to the conclusion of our lesson today. And I want you to, to really think about your prayer life. 
at how you can improve it. Some suggest you keep a, a journal of your prayer life. And I have done that in the past. And I'm constantly amazed, I was constantly amazed that the things I prayed about in a few months were unimportant. So as we go to our Lord in prayer, as we go to our Lord in prayer, uh, let's look on page. Forty-four, and let's read collectively our prayer life, our prayer for the conclusion of today's lesson. God, we want to grow in faith. We want our prayer lives to be mature. Help us to listen you to you and follow Jesus' example. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for tuning in. Today was the fourth lesson from Mark. We have two more, three more. It's three weeks till Easter. I hope that you will continue to tune in week by week as we progress through Holy Week. Next week, we'll spend a little more time together. Thank you.